Right now at 6, students at a Vancouver high school say they're subject to non-stop racism. Do you not see how hard it hurts? Because if we got to cry, then that means there's, there's a problem. Plus, anxiety builds in Oregon's second largest school district with some 200 educators set to receive pink slips. Watching everyone kind of like fall apart as the week wore on was hard. And get ready for the roar in the skies over Hillsboro. See a little afterburner, feel some shake, and uh, just do some low passes. Meet the now fighter pilot who was inspired by a trip to the air show. A very good evening, everyone. Let's get right to breaking news in the gorge where we are monitoring what appears to be a large fire burning in Dallesport, Washington. It's just across the Columbia from the Dalles. Fire crews report flames coming from the Summit Cedar Lumber Yard that's near Tidyman Road and Highway 197. Dispatchers are calling in crews from around the area to help fight these flames. We'll keep you updated, of course, as we learn more. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm David Molko. We continue at six with some students in tears at a Vancouver school board meeting this week after a series of racist incidents. Sydney Dorner talked with some of those students today about behavior they say has made them feel unsafe in their own school. Sydney. Exactly, David. I spoke to students at Fort Vancouver High School who said the culture of blatant racism is pervasive. They described hearing racial slurs in the school and racist language in social media posts from students. Racism does happen at Fort Vancouver High School and our admin doesn't know how to handle it. I've seen firsthand multiple instances of intentional anti-black hate speech directed towards students that I work to uplift. Things like this should not be acceptable. Emotions were high at the Vancouver Public Schools Board meeting this week as students and staff from Fort Vancouver High School described racist behavior they've had to endure at school. Fatu Bojung is one of the students who testified. She says she's heard racial slurs in her classroom and has seen social media posts from her fellow students that refer to black students as the N-word and monkeys. I've seen on her TikTok post that she wasn't sincere about the apology. She kept going on the comments saying that um, it's it wasn't that serious. The joke wasn't about you. Uh, the N-word this, N-word that. In another incident, a student put up posters for a club she had started to support the mental health of black teens. The poster had a photo of her and was defaced with insults and the N-word. Parent Andrew Morgan says this was the breaking point when he decided to go to administration. This day and age that that word was being put on there as a joke, whatever the intention was, that's ridiculous. So something something had to be done. A spokesperson for Fort Vancouver High School said the superintendent has personally met with the students who spoke at the school board. The district said it's committed to make sure all students feel safe and welcome. If we partner and we have more people looking at this uh, uh, difficult issues, um, we're going to get to a place and we're going to ensure to have an environment where students feel, feel safe, feel valued, feel heard. Students we spoke to hope next school year will be different. For other people to see us cry, it's just like, do you not see how hard it hurts? Sydney Dorner, KGW News. In tonight's headlines, Oregon Governor Tina Kotek has thrown the state's only international container terminal a financial lifeline. Last month, the Port of Portland announced Terminal 6 would end cargo container operations in October. The reason, two straight years of operating at a $13 million loss and a lease plan to help offset those losses that fell through. Today, Governor Kotek proposed a $40 million infusion from the state in the upcoming budget and additional money from the Oregon Emergency Board this fall to keep that terminal open. The closure would have meant the loss of around 700 jobs at the port and more than 800 related jobs. Portland police are asking for help identifying a man they say assaulted an officer during a protest on the Portland State campus. This was Thursday, May 2nd. The day police moved in and cleared the library occupation. Police say an officer was dealing with another person when the suspect in the photo reached under the officer's face shield and then sprayed her with pepper spray and then ran off. He appears to be a white male with curly hair, likely in his 20s. If you recognize him, please call Portland police. 
And a person who apparently tried to climb a power line tower to get a selfie suffered serious injuries after they fell 40 feet. Portland Fire says this was in Selwood Park Wednesday evening around 5. Witnesses say they heard a transformer blow. The person was shocked and fell into some bushes. Officials say they were found conscious and alert, and they were actually able to walk to an ambulance. It's unclear, though, if the person actually touched a live wire. Matt? All right, thanks, David. Hey, look at the coast right now. You can't see anything. It's totally socked in at uh, Astoria, 56 degrees. And yes, it's rainy because it's still May. It does that sometimes in the month of May. But out of the coast right now, you can, or, or sorry, out in the gorge at the Dalles, still some clearing there. But here, the story is the wind. It's gusting to 32. We've had gusts 37, 39 miles an hour. So there's a wind advisory up from the Dalles out points east. Now in the Western Valley, some breezes, McMinnville 16, Kelso 14, but nothing like the wind we're seeing in Eastern Oregon. Pendleton sustained at 28. And again, the gusts have been over 30 miles an hour. So we have a wind advisory from the Columbia Gorge near Hood River out through the Dalles over to Pendleton and up through much of Eastern Washington there. Areas of blowing dust will be an issue because the gusts are going to be reaching about 50 miles an hour. So the cooler air that moved in during, well, last night and today helping to produce those winds that we're seeing over in eastern Oregon and the cooler days will stay with us, but the weekend will be mainly dry. Mainly there's one chance of showers, but not a big one. We get rain next week, though. We'll break that down and take an early look at the Memorial Day weekend, David. Yeah, we'll take mainly. Thank you, Matt. This evening, we are keeping a close eye on Oregon's second biggest school district, where hundreds of teachers and staff in Salem Kaiser are about to find out if they will have jobs next year. Thomas Schultz is live at Whitaker Middle School in Kaiser. Thomas, this is all expected as part of big budget cuts, but I imagine that does not make this reality any easier. Yeah, no, David, it doesn't. And parents and substitute teachers tell us that it's been difficult going into schools and talking to teachers this week as they just wait to hear what the news is and if, if they'll even have a job next year. All the while, some teachers are guessing who's going to lose their job. Parents say even students are wondering which teachers just won't be there next year. All that information will be known tomorrow. Now, for months, everyone in Salem Kaiser Schools has known these cuts were going to happen. In April, the district announced it was slashing its budget by $70 million, meaning more than 200 teachers would be laid off and around 400 staff members in all. We asked the school district for an interview. They declined our request, though they did send us a letter to families which says while these cuts are painful, they're necessary. They say that the mass emails are actually the preference of staff members so they can know immediately if they're going to keep their job. The teachers union in their own statement says while they understand layoffs were inevitable, the impact could have been narrowed if money was better spent. And with hundreds of teachers set to lose their jobs, parents worry about the future. I'm worried that our families are not going to be prepared for the significant impact these cuts are going to have. You're taking away teachers, so your class sizes have to get bigger. And even though they keep saying enrollment's down, does not feel like it. And to help with these emails going out tomorrow, the school district has canceled classes on Friday tomorrow. They, this is coming, though, a, a month before the end of school. So these staff members, even though they may be laid off, they still have a month that they're going to continue to teach before eventually losing their job before the next school year. David. Yeah, Thomas Schultz in Kaiser this evening for us. Thank you, Thomas. Now at 6, the city of Portland gave an update today on how it plans to keep people safe this summer, specifically when it comes to gun violence. Blair Best is in the newsroom with details and some new data that shows the number of deadly shootings continues to trend downward. Blair? David, new city data shows the number of shootings, including deadly shootings in Portland, are the lowest they've been in recent years. For some context, there have been just over 280 shootings so far this year, compared to over 300 this time last year and a peak of nearly 500 in 2020. But the work is far from over. Trey Viante Savage never takes a day for granted. Yeah, I'm just trying to make positive out of this negative dark time right now. His mother was shot and killed in Portland when he was young. His brother also died in a shooting less than three months ago. And to lose them the same way over nothing, you know, over over absolutely nothing is, is is trauma and it's a generational trauma. A trauma felt inside Lori Palmer's home where memories of her son line the living room walls. My son was shot six times outside of a local um, after hours here in Portland, Oregon. At the city level, they're doing a job, right? 
and um, they haven't really they haven't experienced gun violence. We have. We have experienced gun violence. The mothers. And we'll start things off with Mayor Wheeler. Early Thursday, city officials talked how they plan to prevent a spike in gun violence come the summer months, a time when the city usually sees a rise in shootings. It's our responsibility to create an environment where safety and security are the norms, not the exceptions. More officers will be hitting the streets with expanded hours, and the city is putting more money toward gun violence prevention. We're committed this uh, summer to continue our emphasis around life safety. New city data shows the number of shootings and homicides by gun violence are trending downward, the lowest in recent years. Although we're making progress, the toll gun violence takes on our community remains unacceptably high. Gun violence has a lasting impact and perpetuates a cycle of pain and trauma, specifically in the black community. Where mothers like Lori live with the pain from years past. First of all, they need to develop relationships with the parents and people of the community that is being affected by gun violence. It's dark dealing with gun violence in our community because it's such a small knit of, you know, African-American community here. So it just, it, it hits those dark days to be dark, but you just got to pull yourself out of it. All right, so the city is also talking and focusing their efforts on certain high risk areas where shootings are more common, like in some east and northeast Portland neighborhoods. Organizations have until tomorrow to apply for up to a $100,000 grant to go towards summer gun violence prevention programs such as youth mentoring and victim support. David. Yeah, programs that can make a big difference. Thank you, Blair. Straight ahead at six, the Oregon International Air Show ready for takeoff. A look at the pilots and the power that'll be zooming over Hillsboro. Plus, some brand new renderings of Portland State's plan to replace the aging Keller Auditorium. Then coming up at 630, the story team political ad fact checks continue tonight. They are taking a look at the Multnomah County DA's race and ads targeting challenger Nathan Vasquez. It claims that he has ties to extremist Republicans holding the water. That's ahead at 630 on the story that's only here on KDW.